Well, if you would take your Bibles and turn to 2 Kings chapter 24. 2 Kings chapter 24. We'll use this passage as a, as a springboard into our main text for today. 2 Kings 24, beginning in verse 10. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I do want to continue to encourage you in your daily Bible reading. If you're here today and you don't know what I'm talking about, we began in January with a read through the Bible in a year uh, encouragement for all of us to be a part of together. And what we've done is we started right at the, be- the beginning of the Bible and in a chronological order when the schedule we put out, everyone's been reading together. Listen, I know once you get behind, it's a little difficult to catch up. So if you're discouraged and you stopped reading, I want to encourage you to pick up another one and start reading with today's reading and go forward from today. If you can catch up with what you missed, that's great. If not, that'll be fine too. Do the best you can. 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 10. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, went up to Jerusalem, and the city came under siege. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. And Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his captains and his officials. And so the king of Babylon took him captive in the eighth year of his reign. And he carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king's house. He cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, just as the Lord had said. Then he led away into exile all Jerusalem, all the captains, all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and the smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. So he led Jehoiachin away into exile exile in Babylon, also the king's mother, the king's wives, and the officials, and the leading men of the land. He led them away into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. All the men of valor, 7,000, and the craftsmen, and the smiths, 1,000, all strong and fit for war. And these the king of Babylon brought into exile to Babylon. Well, as we've been reading in our daily Bible reading, we have seen that the kings of Israel and of Judah have been warned, warned and warned, that God was going to take his people away into captivity if they didn't repent. In fact, the very uh, scriptures that we're reading in our study of the minor prophets show many of those same warnings. If you will obey me, I will show my loving kindness to you. If you won't obey me, then I'm going to send disaster upon you. Sometimes there was repentance, but more often than not, the response was a stiff neck, the Bible refers to it. There was rebellion and an obstinate spirit. And so the king of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came and carried off all except the poorest among the people. In Jeremiah 9 and verse 16, I will scatter them among the nations. And neither they nor their ancestors have known. I will pursue them with the sword until I've made an end of them. Now I told you last week I've really enjoyed the book of Jeremiah. I've really enjoyed it more than I've ever enjoyed it in my life. Most prophets did not live to see the fulfillment of their prophecies. But Jeremiah did. He warned and he prophesied and he told the people this is what was going to happen. And as we looked at last week, he was to stand at different places. Sometimes at the city gate, sometimes before the king's court. Wherever he was sent throughout Jerusalem and throughout the country to proclaim the warnings, he did so. And then he was able to witness and to see the destruction himself. In Lamentations 1, how lonely sits the city that was full of people. The roads of Zion are in mourning because no one comes to the appointed feast. All of her gates are desolate. For these things I weep. Perhaps it is because of lamentations that Jeremiah gets the title, the weeping prophet. 
I imagine any of us would weep if we saw the destruction of our homeland and to think about the glories of Solomon and David and their kingdoms and to see now what had happened to his homeland surely would have made him weep. But it is in this first deportation, that the part of the first deportation, that many of, of the, the nobles were taken into captivity. And among them were Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I have to tell you that uh, whenever I was preparing these lessons, I wanted to not preach on this because it's been preached on a lot. But I just couldn't help myself. It's such an inspiring part of God's word to think about these, these four young men and their faith. So I'll turn to the book of Daniel, and we will spend time this morning, which was a part of our daily Bible reading for this week, Daniel. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 7 is where we'll start. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then he ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and nobles, youths in whom there was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, who had the ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans, and the king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and appointed that they should be educated for three years, and at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, to Daniel he assigned the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shedrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. I'm impressed by these young men. Consider then, let's go to the next slide, consider this. If you were going to take some young men, and you were going to change who they are, and make them into what you want them to be. If you were going to brainwash them, if you were going to take the person that they were and to erase that and to create a new person, what would you do? You might do these things. You might kidnap them away from their homeland, away from their families, away from the people who've been a good influence on them, upon those who would make them to be a better people or to increase their faith, take them away from them. And then to brainwash them with, and reprogram them with new teaching, with new literature, with a new language. Uh, you might give them new names. You're not going to be called your old name anymore. You're a new person now. I'm going to rename you. So when we look at these three young, young men and Daniel, we are impressed as we read, them because, read about them because they did not conform even though they were under this kind of pressure. So that always catches my eye. Sandy Adams has written, Daniel lived among pagan people, worked in pagan institutions, was schooled in pagan philosophy, was surrounded by pagan practice, yet Daniel fiercely remained loyal to God. Rather than be tainted by the world around him, he remained faithful to God. I like that because it's the way that I want to be. I want to be in the world but not of the world. I want to be able to exist around godless people but remain godly. And so I wanted us to take, a take time today to look at Daniel 
and to see how he was able to resist such pressure. This map shows the, the vast territory and kingdom of the Babylonian Empire. As you can see, there was a conquest of most all the Fertile Crescent, including also the areas there of, of Judah. About a hundred years before, a little more than a hundred years before, the king of Assyria had come and conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, this is a reconstruction of the palace of Nebuchadnezzar. You can tell it was a vast complex. If you look at some of those vehicles over here, these trucks that are parked over here, you can see what a, a, an enormous complex this was. Here's another picture that shows some of the reconstructed walls of this great kingdom, of course, which is now in ruins. This particular tablet here, this Babylonian chronicle tablet, is one of a series of Babylonian records summarizing the main events of the year. Each entry begins with a reference to the year of the reign of a particular king. And this tablet includes the record of the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Here's what it says. Nebuchadnezzar encamped against the city of Judah. And on the second day of the month of Adur, he seized the city and captured the king. He appointed there a king of his heart and received its heavy, heavy tribute and sent it to Babylon. So let's consider this morning then how these young men, how they were able to resist this intense pressure to conform. How could they resist being sent away from their homeland, given new names, new food, or attempt to give them new food? How could they resist all these things? Number one, how to withstand conformity. They ignored the excuses. Let's consider some of the excuses that they ignored. Number one, I'm young. They didn't use the fact that they were young as a reason to conform. Or how about this one? The no one will know excuse. Who's going to know? It's easier to conform to the pattern of the world, isn't it, when we're away from home? When we're away from those who will keep us accountable, those who love us enough to help us to be better than we are. Or how about this one? They resisted the, it's God's fault excuse. How many people have abandoned their faith because they blame God for something that's happened? Do you think these young men could be depressed at what had happened in their lives? They'd been taken away from their homes. They been, were living in this foreign country. Why did you allow this to happen to me, God? Why did this happen? Could that have given them a reason to be disobedient or to just give up? On their faith. They also resisted the excuse of everyone else is doing it. And you're going to find that as we continue in our reading here. That they stood against this peer pressure. This pressure to conform. That everyone else is doing it. It reminds me of Luke 14 where Jesus taught. But he said to them. A man was giving a big dinner and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slaves to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. Man, as human beings, we really are masters of excuses. We are experts at blaming others and justifying our own wrongdoings. It's hard for us as human beings to accept responsibility for the things in our lives. It's really easy for us to make excuses and to blame others. But if we're going to resist being conformed to the world, we have got to put aside those things that are excuses as to why we can't. To take our own lives into our hands and to do what's right and to ignore excuses. Number two, not only did they ignore their excuses, but they were very insistent in their obedience. Now let's continue reading beginning in verse 8. This time 8 through 21. 
But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. And so he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces look more haggard than the the youths who were your own age? And then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test your servants for ten days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. And let our appearance be observed in your presence. And the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food. And deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in the matter and tested them for ten days. And at the end of the ten days their appearance seemed better And they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. And so the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine which they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. And as for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. And at the end of the days which the king had specified for presenting them, The commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them. And out of all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the king's personal service. And as for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all of his realm. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. I want you to notice this, and I put here a couple of other renderings from various translations. Daniel had made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food. He was determined. So even though he was in this new place with all of the evil influence around him, he was able to resist conforming because he was determined not to conform. It seems simple, but it's true. The NIV says, also with a good word, is the word resolved. He resolved not to. The King James Version and the New King James says he was purposed. He purposed in his heart that he would not be conformed. That he would not defile himself with the king's choice food. So let's consider then this uh, insistent obedience as we continue to Read the text. Turn to chapter 3. Chapter 3. These young men were, were faithful even in the midst of great social pressure. Notice verses 1 through 8 of chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits, And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps and prefects and governors and counselors and treasurers and judges and magistrates and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had made. Then the satraps and prefects and governors and counselors and treasurers and judges and magistrates And all the rulers of the provinces had assembled for the dedication of the image of Nebuchadnezzar, the king, that he had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed and commanded, O peoples, nations of every language, at the moment that you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, You are to fall down and are to worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whosoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. Therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations and men of every language 
fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And for this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. Now let's pause here for a moment. Imagine this scene of this great statue that Nebuchadnezzar has commanded everyone to bow before. And here are all the peoples of all nations, and they're all there. Different languages, different cultures of people who've all been brought together, all under captivity. And these three young men are there as well. And when the sound of the music comes, everyone around them, all of them, conform to what the king has asked them to do. And they all bow down. And here are these three men in this moment of decision having to decide, what are we going to do? Are we going to bow? Everyone else is. Are we going to bow down? My mom and dad won't know. Are we going to bow down? I can blame God for this because he's brought me to this place. But all those excuses have been discarded. And here are some men who are determined that they are going to be faithful. They are not going to conform under intense social pressure to do so. Everyone else is. But they didn't. They were determined. They were insistent in their obedience to God, even in the midst of such great pressure. I have to be honest with you. I don't know if I could overcome such pressure. It's intense pressure. Continuing in verse 8, consider next the political pressure that was put upon them. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You yourself, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews among you whom you've appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image I have set up? Now if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music to fall down and worship the image I have made, very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, And what God is there who is able to deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Wow, what a moment. Let's reread verses 17 and 18 and notice these words. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. This is an immense political pressure upon them, given to them by the king. Nebuchadnezzar, verse 13 says, in rage, gave an order to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were brought before the king. He was angry, but even though he was angry at them, he gave them another chance. What pressure? Okay, let's ignore what happened. If you're willing to do it this time, everything will be okay. And they come up with this great statement of faith. They were insistent in their obedience. 
And then thirdly, in this section, of course, there was this great life and death pressure. Verse 19. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath. His facial expression was altered. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. And these men were tied up in their trousers and coats and their caps and all their clothes and were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because of the king's command that it was so urgent, the furnace had been made extremely hot, and the flame of fire flew the, uh, slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of the blazing fire, still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste and responded and said to his high officials, Was it not three men we cast into the midst of the fire? And they answered, Certainly, O king. And he said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking around in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar came near the door of the furnace and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God. Come here. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. And the satraps and prefects and governors and kings and high officials gathered around them and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on their bodies, nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor was there even a smell of fire that had come upon them. And Nebuchadnezzar responded, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Social pressure political pressure, and life and death pressure. And these three young men were insistent in their obedience, even when they knew it could mean their life. Notice verse 14. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. But even if he does not. You know, I've used this scripture a lot of times in explaining why do bad things happen to good people? Why did God deliver Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And why did he allow Stephen to die at the hands of those who stoned him to death? Why didn't he deliver him? I don't know. I don't know why sometimes God makes the choices that he makes. But there's one thing for sure. God is able to deliver us. He is able and our determination to obey God should not be on whether or not God delivers us. Our decision to obey God is because of a determination in knowing that God is able to deliver us. And even if he chooses not to, I'm still going to love him and follow him. That is a statement of faith. Sometimes God, by his sovereign choice, will deliver us from our trials, but sometimes he doesn't. But it doesn't matter with regards to my determination to follow him. You see, I am going to be insistently obedient. Even when everything bad happens, as it seems it has to Daniel, in a sense. Now he's been elevated to a good place in the kingdom. God's taken care of him. But for these young men, their faith is continually being pressured when God delivers them, they obey. When God doesn't, they obey. So here are a couple of pictures that kind of illustrate. These three young men were insistent in their obedience and God did deliver them. And he's able to deliver us as well. Number three. Now we're talking about uh, this Withstanding conformity. These three young men and Daniel had ingrained spiritual disciplines. In, ingrained spiritual disciplines. Look in chapter 2 now for a moment. This is, if you've been reading along, you'll know this is concerning the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. 
Now, Nebuchadnezzar was, was pretty shrewd because when he had this dream, rather than just saying, come and I'm going to gather all the, the wise men, I'm going to tell you the dream, and then you're, you can uh, uh, tell me the interpretation. He didn't do that. He was smarter than that because he knew they'd make up something. To save your own skin, I guess you'd just make up something. So what he says is, okay, come forward and you tell me what I dreamed and then interpret it. I said, nobody can do that. Then you're all going to die. All of you wise men are going to die. Now, in verse 16 of chapter 2, we get a peek then at some of the spiritual discipline that these young men had in Daniel. Because Daniel's going to ask God for the dream and its interpretation. So Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, about the matter. Now notice. In order that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his friends might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. What is he really asking his friends to do here? To pray about this. Pray to God about this. Pray for an answer. Request compassion from God concerning this mystery. Turn to Daniel chapter 6 now. We'll try to draw this lesson to a close. Daniel chapter 6. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom that they should be in charge of the whole kingdom. And over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one. And these satraps might be accountable to them, and that the king might not suffer loss. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps, because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Then the commissioners and satraps began to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regards to governmental affairs. This sounds like typical politics, doesn't it? But they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful with no negligence or corruption to be found in him. Then these men said, said we will find no ground of accusation against Daniel unless we find it as regard to the law of his God. So these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, prefects and satraps, the high officials and the governors, have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce it as an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for thirty days shall be cast into the lion's den." Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not, be charred, uh, may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document, that is, the injunction. Now, when Daniel knew, now notice carefully, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered the house, now his roof chamber had windows open toward Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on, his, kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. And these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. And I want you to notice something. This is really important. Yes, in times of struggle, Yes, in times of turmoil. Yes, in times when there's great pressure upon us, we need to pray. We saw that in the earlier example of prayer where Daniel asked his three friends to pray because there was an emergency. But I would like to suggest to you and to let you see that prayer was not something in Daniel's life that was only left for times of emergency. The Bible here says that he continued giving thanks to God as he had been doing previously. This was a spiritual discipline 
in his life, something he did in order to grow his faith and to keep it strong. Now let's draw this lesson to a close. Could I withstand the pressure of conform that Daniel faced? Which is more true of me? I'm faithful or I make excuses for why I'm not? Who am I going to blame? What am I going to blame for my unfaithfulness? Which is more true? I read the Bible and pray more than I used to. I read the Bible and pray less than I used to. In withstanding conformity, we have to realize, brothers and sisters, it's time to discard excuses. It's time to be more insistent. It's time to ingrain more spiritual disciplines. If we want to withstand the pressure of conforming to the world standards, then we can learn from looking at these four young men who were not going to blame anyone else or to give any excuses as to why they couldn't be faithful. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the lives of these four young men who grew to be seasoned, mature men of faith who were stripped of all the things in their life and that were precious to them and could have blamed you could have been unfaithful to you, but we're determined to not conform, but to be faithful to you. It is our desire, Lord, to be the same, to resist the excuses, to resist the pressure, and to love you enough to be faithful to you, even if we have to stand alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you'd like to come this morning to confess your faith in Jesus Christ and be baptized for remission of your sins, you have a loving Father who's ready to receive you. Or if you'd like to say, you know, I've conformed to the world and I want the strength to be stronger. Will you come as we stand and sing? We'll encourage you now.